You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. How many millions do you make? We're all going to die. But that's the gamble. That competition or competing, it drives you. How do you know what good taxidermy is? All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and today... Our guest is Jeremy Judkins at Judkins Custom Taxidermy, and we talk about getting into taxidermy. We do a little taxidermy history and quiz. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I think it gets you uh, a little a little taste of of um, where taxidermy has come from yep. to how it's evolved today. It's a good little show, and you'll meet Jeremy Judkins, who is going to meet with us. Basically, we're going to drop an episode every Tuesday. Taxidermy Tuesday is going to begin here at Gritty for, I don't know, a month and a half or two months. We're just going to share little nuggets of information every Tuesday with Jeremy. And uh, I think it'll be interesting. I'm I'm really fascinated by taxidermy. Yeah. He does. And he does. Like, he is one of those guys that is very detail oriented when it comes to amount. I think the next episode is how do you care for your trophy in the field? Yep. What do you do? Preparations. Yeah. Like like in the field, velvet, fur. You know, hide. How do you keep it from slipping or yep. rotting? What are all the tricks there? And he's got some things I've never really known about yeah. until uh, and new products that are on the market that yep. help you preserve velvet and yeah, things and like I've that. On seen them, I've just never used them. I haven't yeah. been lucky enough to go kill a, a velvet butt. Before we get into the show, all you people that are tuning into this sh- this podcast probably have an interest in taxidermy. That's why you're listening. If you do, then and you haven't heard the podcast we did with Coulter Day, you'll want to go back and check that out. Yep. That Coulter Day owns Borderland, and and they make those antique-looking pack boards that yep. you put mounts on. And you've got to see it. If you haven't looked at the video version of the podcast or haven't checked out the podcast at all, go check it out. It's a couple episodes yep. back. Yep. And right now, you'll save 20% on the pack. If yep. you go and buy one for your for your mount, you can put fur. You can do the bear rugs look pretty the cool. Bear rugs look pretty cool. Yep. The, sheep. the bear hide sheep. Yep. So check that out. And uh, like I said, you save how much is it, Brad? Twenty percent, and it ends on March twenty second. So you have between now and March twenty second to save twenty percent on that pack. And then I yep. think he's going to go maybe to ten percent. Yeah, uh, we haven't worked out the details on that, but for sure until March twenty second, twenty percent. Yep. So that's very cool. And then our friend Jim Nacarado, yep. he makes these uh, skull hangers. And yep. all my elk are hanging in the house, these Euro mounts. It's perfect for hanging in the house. Uh, he's got the ones that mount to the wall, but you can see this custom one that's the state of yep. Idaho. There's also some other ones that uh, are also, what do you call that? Like a, a table mount. Table mount. Or, yeah. For your- they have the wall mount, table mount. Like I said, they'll do custom. They're working on. On Initial Ascent's website, they're working on getting the custom mounts in. Yep. So Initial Ascent Packs is where you can find these uh, skull hangers. Yep. Iron Mountain skull hangers. They're really cool. I've mentioned them before. We did a podcast with Jim that we're going to drop soon. And if you have a Euro and you're looking for a cool, uh, you know, I think it's the best. I don't like uh, skull hookers much. They're kind of flimsy. Uh, there's a few out there. The table mounts, uh, generally, I don't like, but the ones that Jim makes are they're awesome. Yeah. They're they're yeah. the best I've ever seen. He hand makes them. He's just a fabricator out of Idaho. He can't beat the durability, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're cool. So you go to Initial Ascent Backpacks, and you'll find them in stock over there. Use the code Gritty, yep. and you'll save some money. Um, also, right now, Peaks just came out with their new headlamp, which I mentioned on a couple of gear shows a while back. It's called the the duo. Yep, the backcountry duo. Backcountry duo. Now, there's some headlamps that look similar to this. That Pretty much are, identical, almost. They are not this lamp. Correct. Like this lamp has. Lampers and I went through extensive testing. Stealthy Hunter. So the the others that you may see, the battery has been totally changed. The internal parts of of 100 been changed. The like programming, programming the light bulb itself. Yep, the light upgraded. bulbs. So this thing, what I wanted, what we were looking for, was a lamp that burned crazy long where you didn't have to worry about like a lot of non-hunting people who go out and and uh you know backpack 
they don't need a super bright light that casts a light, you know, right. really far that can that can burn all night because yep. they don't night hike with a dead, you know, with a dead, you know, deer on their back through grizzly country. Yep. So they don't they don't need this. Um, it's very rare for just an average backpacker to have to night hike. Yep. We do. We hunters do. And so we wanted something that really fit our needs. It's rechargeable, which was was a must. We needed it to be rechargeable, but we needed it to have a crazy runtime on bright light. Yep. And it took us quite a while in some testing and designing to come up with this sucker. It is nothing like what uh what's what other options are out there. It's unique, it's different, yep. and it's it's awesome. So check check this this is still my prototype. I've been running this prototype for like two years as I've been um, yep. messing around with it. This version I really like, but the, the newer one is different band. It's got some differences. I need to get my hands on the brand new one, but honestly, they're selling so fast. Um, yep. It's crazy. So use the code gritty over there. And I might mention this while we're at it. We don't get a, a any, any um, kickback from this, but this anchor charger, we've been talking about it. We tested it quite a bit. Yep. This anchor charger, it's a three panel, sol- uh, three solar panel charger. Yep. This thing has been incredible. We used it a lot this last year. Can't recommend it enough. It's 14 ounces. Between this and a dark energy power bank, uh, one, we pretty much had unlimited power. Even on forecast days, we, we used it throughout the spring, summer, fall, all the way through the November hunts. Yep. And we really didn't need anything but one dark energy battery pack, but we do have a code with dark energy. Correct. So I would uh, check that. That's new. We've been saying we had a code, but we didn't. But we do now. You get 10% off. Correct. So, and then I would recommend getting your hands on one of these anchor solar chargers. Yeah, pairing those up together. Is... And then the dual headlamp. Dude, you, you've you got uh, a pretty cool setup. I also like the um, the rechargeable stereo pin, the little UL light. Yeah, I'm still stuck tiny. with the classic. The classic <laughs> that has big chunky double A batteries. Switch over to the ultra light. We just want to say thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoy this episode and stay gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today my guest is Jeremy Judkins. Yep. Uh, and Jeremy is a taxidermist. That's right. For for how many years? My first mount was in two thousand, so 22 okay. years. Oh, oh, I wanted to sit down and do a podcast series with a taxidermist and kind of get to know. I have so many questions. Yeah. For, for taxidermists, early. taxidermy in general, how you do, deal with trophies, trophy care in the field, getting it in, and just, just tons of questions. So I thought we could do a series where we just kind of meet and we just record some quick uh, podcasts here and there. I don't know how many parts we'll make this. Okay. We'll do one a week. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty fun. Awesome. So my co-host today is Brad Hunt. To break the ice, I am going to hit you up with a taxidermy quiz. Oh, boy. Okay. Now, don't feel any pressure. Okay. Jeremy, (laughs) don't feel any pressure. It will only tell us how good of a taxidermist you are is if you can pass this. Okay. Okay. (laughs) All right. I never was good in school, so. <laughs> Term taxidermy is derived from Latin, uh, Arabic, or Greek. No pressure. I don't know. I would say Latin. You're both wrong. It's Greek. Uh, dang. So I'm not a taxidermist. We'll get into that. <laughs> None Me of this either. really has a lot to do with modern day. Yeah. But it's interesting. What tasks do mu- museum taxidermists perform? A, preserve and prepare, uh, prepare replicas of animals. Make artificial plants, rocks, and soil, each of the above. All of the above. I got that one right. (laughs) Correct. Which subject expertise is not required for a taxidermist? Physics, sculpture, zoology. Physics. Correct. Which chemical process is used to preserve animal skins? Tanning, finishing, oiling. Probably all of the above on that, too. You'd know better than me. I think. What did it say? Tanning? tanning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, which method is mostly used to make the specimens of vertebrates? Um, solid foam model method, fiberglass method, freeze-dried method. All of the above on that, too. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> which is the oldest mounted animal in existence? Crocodile, rhinoceros, or tortoise? I'm going to guess rhino. 
I'm going to say tortoise. It's a crocodile. Really? Dang. Yep. I just threw tortoise because I figured that was the most awkward <laughs> one. So, <laughs> Where was the oldest rhinoceros mounted? Italy, Holland, Egypt. I'll go with Egypt. I don't know any of these answers, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> Holland. It was in some cathedral in Italy. So let's go back to this oldest mounted Is it animal. rhinoceros? It is rhinoceros. Oh, nice. The oldest mount was the crocodile, as far as I know. And it says, where was the rhinoceros mounted? And it says Italy. Now, here it says, the first known taxidermists were the ancient Egyptians. They developed early forms of animal preservation using injections, spices, oils, and such. As early as 2200 BC, they were preserving and mummifying the pharaoh's dogs, cats, monkeys, birds, etc., and burying them in tombs. They even preserved a hippopotamus, which must have been quite a feat. Since the purpose of taxidermy for the Egyptians had little to do with art or anatomy, the final products didn't have to and probably didn't look great by standards, by our standards, but they tried. The earliest known mount, this is the state of Idaho, mm-hmm. by the way, documenting God's this. country. Yes, <laughs> Museum of Idaho. The earliest known mount in existence today is a crocodile hanging from the ceiling of a cathedral in Pontinossa, Italy. I know I butchered that. Hmm. So you're saying it's a rhinoceros. On the, on that's, the that's what the quiz says. Quiz says over here <laughs> they're saying crocodile in Italy. Hmm. You know the rhinoceros versus the crocodile thing. Mm-hmm. It says the earliest known mount in existence today. Maybe that rhinoceros doesn't exist today, but they know right. that it did exist. Possibly could be. It's interesting. They're both in Italy. How much money do American taxidermists make in a year? Six hundred million, five hundred million, four hundred million. How many millions do you make? I was going to say, like, <laughs> no millions. <laughs> uh, uh, Broke, 90% of them. <laughs> this is a, 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 a job of passion in art. Um, I think they mean a, for all Across the board. What kind of, how many million well, dollars? Well, I'm going to go with the lowest because I know four, most tax It's a $400 million dollar industry. It says uh, arsenic was widely used to repel insects from the late 1700s up into the 20th century, but it was phased out in favor of less dangerous chemicals like borax. Yeah, we're all going to die. We still use a lot of chemicals. Like, <laughs> yeah. It will be what kills us, I'm sure. <laughs> Which of the following animal is toughest to mount? Okay, this one. You ought to know this one probably. Fish, deer, bear. Oh, well, I'd say fish because I don't do fish. <laughs> That's interesting. How um, well do you paint? <laughs> yeah. Would you say that mounting ungulates or predators, which one's harder? Predators are harder, in my opinion. I, I think that's evidenced by the number of ugly predator mounts that are rampant. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. I mean, most most that's why I, when I judge a taxidermist, I'm usually looking at their predator mounts yeah. to determine if they're skilled or not. Most of the time, that's how people do. Like, let's see your cats. Yeah. And if you, know. you can pull off a cat, I'm like, okay, yeah. they know what they're doing. It's very interesting, the, the history of all of this. Uh, also, the a lot of those early mounts were anthropomorphic, meaning they, they had like a raccoon smoking mm-hmm. a cigarette in a chair. That was kind of the yeah, taxidermy right. to do. Yeah. So like it or not, the art of taxidermy has contributed to broader conservation goals. Um, William Hornady, chief taxidermist at the Smithsonian in the 1880s, was dismayed at the widespread slaughter of American bison. So he brought some specimens back to Washington, displayed them, uh, tried to get people to take interest in them, in their plight. And his work contributed to the creation of the federally protected bison range in Yellowstone, which was instrumental in saving the species. So uh, interesting how taxidermy has its history and how it's developed. And mm-hmm. you look at taxidermy today and it's absolutely stunning. Now, one of the things I asked Brad on the way up here to, to see you Jeremy was, how do you know what good taxidermy is? Man, you're just, and I think for me, the, the, the number one thing is just not without breaking it down into details, but like, I can't tell you why it's good taxidermy, but I can look at it and just say it, that's good. Mm -hmm. And the way that I kind of judge that, I guess is, does it look real? Yeah. Does it look alive? Does it look alive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's. 
Yeah, definitely a lot of key points on, well, I go to those expos. I don't even look at horns or I'm looking at eyes. I'm looking Details. at ears. Yeah, break, a lot of times. Break down what it is that makes, a, like, what is it that we're seeing that we don't know we're seeing? Yeah. Well, and I would say that's why you judge on the predators because mm-hmm. we all know what a predator looks like because we have mm-hmm. dogs. We have cats. You don't know so much what a live deer you haven't had your hands on a live deer so i think that's why most people can see the predators more and plus they don't have a big rack to look at you know so to distract yeah i think the eyes on the The, front of the head are a lot harder probably to not to, to get to be symmetrical yeah than the eyes on the side well in the pupils you can see the pupils on most predators uh, yeah, uh right. where they're looking um versus like a deer you might have to have a flashlight to see the pupils and you yeah. may not even know what a deer pupil looks like but i think that you know as somebody goes up if you don't know what you're really looking at but it looks natural like the ears are in a natural position Mm -hmm. um the eyes are looking natural and finish work is probably one of the big things too the paint you know we do do a lot of painting and rebuilding nodules on the nose and getting them Mm -hmm. looking soft and um yeah those little details so the little things that make it look alive um it's probably easier to explain what makes bad taxidermy than yeah. it is to explain what makes good taxidermy. Well, like you said, in Oregon, you can get a taxidermy license for $7. <laughs> it looks mm-hmm. like it. 650 so, 650 <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Brad looked at so, the answer. It's even yeah. less. I mean, everybody can be a taxidermist. You know, when yeah. I started out, it was a hobby. It was fun. Yeah. My dad did one with videos and books. And I'm like, oh, that looks awesome. But it looked yeah. horrible. You know, yeah. been a taxidermist for 22 years. I've probably been good for 10, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it takes years and years to. What do they say? 10,000 10, hours. hours to become, you know, an expert. Yeah. A master at, yeah. at a craft. Yeah. And, and it is completely true. I mean, there's definitely some taxidermists that have an, an edge, which like if you have an art background or you mm-hmm. can. Draw in, just an sculpt. innate natural ability, I'm sure. Yeah, and I don't have that. You know, mine is repetition and those hours. You know, I cannot draw a stick figure. Um, <laughs> but tell me but, this, because your work is beautiful. You know, walking around uh, the studio, and this is the cleanest tax. If, if you guys are, are listening to the podcast, you'll want to go watch it because we're going to be overlaying a lot of the podcast mm-hmm. with some of the work that, that you've got here in the studio. People can see what the studio looks like. This is the cleanest taxidermy studio I have ever seen. Yeah. It looks like something in like, like, I don't know, some swanky district downtown, yeah. you know? Well, uh, yeah. And I think that that helps us like my kid's school or when mm-hmm. my, it's like, what does your dad do? I'm a wildlife artist. And I don't think you can do art in a, just a complete mess yeah. of stuff. So we try to keep it clean. It's hard. We spill foam all the time. We spill paint, <laughs> but we try to keep it clean. I think it's important for when you come in, it's, you can appreciate what we have going on yeah. a little bit more than if you're tripping over buckets or. This is not normal. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do have some messy parts of it that you don't see like, you know, skinny, right, right. skinning rooms, obviously that kind of stuff can get messy, but um, yeah, no. we try to try to keep it more of an art studio versus. Mm-hmm. What your typical taxidermy yeah. studio with a boiling vat of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So tell me this, like, um, um, what's what's the uh, Jeremy Judkins story exactly? How does a guy get into taxidermy in two thousand? Why? And you were saying you just alluded to you know a past like when you were younger, yeah, being interested, but yet you say you're not that artistic, but yet everything in here screams art. art. Yeah, I mean. There's more, I would say I can't draw to save my life, but <laughs> I think filmmaking is an art and, yeah, and I found for a sure. way. There's different ways. And like I say, I can sculpt or I can look, Steve's out there working on a deer right now. We're just looking at it, just eyeballing. And it's like, no, that neck looks a little short and I'm better with my hands, you know, mm-hmm. like sculpting, mm-hmm. modeling, whatever. And it is repetition. And, uh, I guess when it all started for me, I mean, I've always been a hunter outdoorsman. 
um, we we're always killing good animals and things. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I, as a kid, I remember taking an elk hide and like, Oh, I'm going to do the brain tan and yeah. things like that, that just messing around <laughs> never turned out. Like, <laughs> yep. And, uh, I mean, even our crew here, they're awesome. I can't mm-hmm. do it with out our crew without my crew yeah. at the other business. I guess for me, I always wanted to be like, I always loved animals, had animals growing up, thought I was going to be a veterinarian. And then, uh, I went into the like woodworking business and window Mm -hmm. coverings. That's what my dad did. And I started doing some of that. And anyway, uh, my dad was, had an interest in it too. Like Mm -hmm. we'd always make, like, I remember as 10 year old going to classes of making our own arrows, you know, like the mountain men type stuff and loved it, loved all that kind of stuff being hands on. And then again, like I said, my dad bought a couple of taxidermy videos and he's like, I'm going to try this. And really, Mm -hmm. and he popped them in and did it and he did one and I'm like, Oh, that looks awesome. I want to try it. And then it just, uh, from there it was kind of, it was fun. It was a hobby. And then I got really lucky. I had some other taxidermists that fell kind of into my life with yeah. um, part of the other business I had of a guy, his name's Bill Fox, and he mm-hmm. invited me to come spend some time with him, you know, in his shop. And he was tremendous help, got me kind of going. Yeah. And then, yeah, just years of paying money to go in shops. I never did like a school. Um, there are some really good schools. We actually do some classes here if somebody wants to learn from beginner to advance. Uh, but it's one-on-one stuff. And that's what I did. I, wow. I went in and man, I really like your cats. I want to spend a week here and do a cat. And then I'd come home and do one. And then I'd go to another shop that I like their cats mm-hmm. or with shows that we have competitions and seminars from, I'll go sit in a world show I'm like one of the only ones that like, we have a bunch of us that are all friends and, you know, I'll go sit in all day (laughs) seminars to pick up like one thing, you know, now, I mean, when you're learning, it's like a sponge, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe all this stuff they're going over and showing me. When did it, when did it shift from like this hobby thing to all of a sudden a career? Did you, did you just kind of work for others? No, I I always just did my own stuff. And then it was like, friends. And then it was like, okay, now I'm at a point where I can advertise. And, 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 and I had my other job that I could, you know, it was fall like, back on. And- yeah. So I, I had that. And so it was like, in my other shop in Salt Lake, it was, I just had a little studio thing set yeah. up and it was, I could work four hours on this and four hours over there, whatever, you know, a day. Um, and then probably it was like, yeah, like around 2010 ish, that's when I was kind of like, okay, I'm going to do this for people, um, in advertising and mm-hmm. competing. And and now, uh, how does it feel? You're pretty established at this point. Yeah. yeah. You have a lot of uh, work coming in all the time. And now you're, you're in the process of, you have a number of people that work for you yeah. to get things done. I've heard from other taxidermists, friends of mine, <clears throat> that... There's this process, there's this stage that taxidermy shops get to where it's like, okay, I have, I do good work. People, I'm in demand, but you can only, it's a piece of art. You can yeah. only, it's not a manufacturing, mm-hmm. like you just, uh, you know, you just putting widgets together and you can just add more machines you and then you can mass put, yeah. producing yeah. at all. Yeah, there's, <laughs> and, and, and so each person has to be an artist too. You can't just add a machine and then, and then just ramp up production. Yeah. And so I've heard from other tax numbers that you get to the stage where it's like, okay, I need this, this to grow, to get, to satisfy the demand, but then maybe the quality can drop off or, or the cost of these people that have talent is difficult to cover with the income and the output that, that you're able to, to generate. And it's like this, I've had a lot of friends that blew up their tax number shop and then shrunk it right back down. Yeah. I, I mean, it is, it's there. Most studios that are around our area are one, two man mm-hmm. operations. Yeah, yeah. It's because if you do scale to, and there are, you know, companies and taxidermy studios that have gone to that bigger production and 
you know, this person does a lot of the life sizes, this person does finish work or Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, for us, yeah, I mean, you see, we're not, I don't really want to move into another huge building or something to mass scale, but we, we try to maybe specialize more in, yeah, just, just more of an art piece. Like I'm not going to compete with somebody that's just starting taxidermy Mm -hmm. and is in their garage with no overhead and they're going to do a deer for 600 bucks. I'm not going to compete. Yeah. you know, with that. So, I mean, I guess that's the thing, but too. that's the gamble. Like I was reading, um, and this is another podcast topic I want to get into, you know, <clears throat> how do you find a good taxidermist? Because I, my, I'm of the opinion, okay, if you're going to just do a deer, a basic deer mount, I, I think that that's possible for the guy in the garage. Yeah. Right? Oh, there's, I mean, some guys, I mean, just that, like I started out, I mean, you don't need a fancy studio or whatever to do mm-hmm. good tax or vast years of experience. Yeah. But if you're going to do a cat, yeah, <laughs> I think you're screwed. Like with some full body mount well, stuff, yeah, or some really stuff. like at that point, cause we've all seen nightmare taxidermy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the big thing for me. Okay. How much am I going to pay for a taxidermist? And mm-hmm. it kind of, I don't know about you, Jeremy, but if it's going to cost me a thousand bucks, 1200 to have this mount done here or six, 700 to, to roll the dice. I'm really reluctant to just go with the guy in the garage uh, well, because every, I do not want to get it back. Well, well, when you're, when you're doing a mount, your goal is to be able to look at that animal for years and years and years, you know, your, your kids, your grandkids, you know, I look at grandpa's deer <laughs> right. type thing, you know, but I think that's where when you push, it's, it's, you gone to your buddy's house and he's like, yeah, my brother-in-law did this mm-hmm, one. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I can tell. And he's like, yeah, I hate it, but he did it. And I, I don't know what Gave to me do a with deal. it. <laughs> yeah. But no, everybody has different needs. You know, like, yeah. I mean, my worst nightmare is when a customer comes in and like, I don't have a place to put it. It's probably going to end up in storage unit or in my Ugh. garage. I hate hearing that it's going to end up in your garage because yeah. I don't care how good we do it in your garage. Eventually it's not going to yeah. look good, you know, type yeah. thing. Cause yeah. it's, but everybody has different needs, you know, like, um, maybe, yeah, just price point or mm-hmm. that's their, their biggest thing. I know a lot of guys, there are those people who don't really mind that it looks awful mm-hmm. or don't, well, see they it. can't see it. You know, I mean, I even have like, when we bring a student in, I try to, first of all, like, can you see, like, I mean, trust me, every one of these mounts in here has problems. So <laughs> it's like, go in there, see if you tell can. me, see what the problem is. Show me, uh-huh. you know, what, what we could, can, can you actually see it? And there's a lot of taxidermists that can't yeah. actually mm-hmm. see what's wrong. They're like, oh, man, it looks awesome, you know, or something. And it's like, yeah. d- dive in what? deep and see, cause there, there is going to be flaws on Mm -hmm. every mount i think i was gonna kind of bring that comparison into it as well as you know as a an experienced filmmaker Mm -hmm. when you're trying to hire somebody and bring somebody in they obviously have to fit the bill you know because Mm -hmm. you could you could bring in anybody like there are guys that probably do certain edits better than than even you yeah but it's not your style you know like in your critique and all that stuff plays a big factor same with the tax and and we all have styles too. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can go in and look in a lot of times I can tell who mounted something just by their style or the way they paint or, you know, when, when I, what I really love is when I go in and see, you know, like an expo, cause there's so many mounts and everybody did it. And it's like that one right there, that's a nice job, you know, or something Mm -hmm. or, um, but most of the time I can tell who did it, you know, type thing. Right. I mean, that's, and, and that's even like the sculpting of forms or, you know, we might prefer one sculptor over another just because mm-hmm. it fits our style better. Or well, that. and looking at like the buckles and the trophies and plaques and stuff. I mean, Jeremy, yeah. seems like you've done a pretty dang good job. You well, know? <laughs> it's fun. I think I was watching one of your podcasts the other day that was just like that competition or competing. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it drives you. And I wish that we'll talk about competition stuff, but I think it's real important to compete as a taxidermist. And unfortunately I'm not doing it this year, but, um, I've done it every year for Mm -hmm. quite a while. And the reason why I love to do it is because we all suck and we need to improve. Yeah. The competing 
really helps you. It helps you it's learn. Got to push you. And then we can only do like I mean, this deer. This was my competition deer last year. I mean, I have a hundred hours in that. I I like the getting into detail. I like the eye house kind of rolled back on that buck. I, yeah, it's, it's pretty and cool. like so, if if you're listening, you're not you're not able to see this thing, but he, this buck is suspended in midair. Uh, I assume attached by the horn to this to this pine tree that he's raking that's getting thrashed the angles the way it's balanced you know you, you can tell you've done some stuff to keep that thing from tipping over yeah but it messes with your brain like mm -hmm. it's this this buck doing his thing and then all the detail on the deer the muscles in those shoulders like I look at those like where he's yeah. really dug in his ears back and man it, it's just uh for those that are listening you'll go we're going to overlay the film with some some yeah. video of this stuff and you can take a look at it but so much detail and design that went into that mm -hmm. it's uh it's super cool well and even even like you look at that i mean ear placement is huge is key you know yeah. you, if you've ever watched an animal a deer rake a tree i mean you know we just we go off of photos a lot mm -hmm. of reference photos mm -hmm. you know that one was right off a photo that i was trying to copy mm -hmm. and mimic you know a yeah. live deer and we use tons of reference. I mean, every day we're looking yeah, at pictures. For of, sure. You know, we're out there working on a Cape Buffalo. Like, let's let's this look is, at some of the stuff. You're looking at a 100-hour project. You're only going to probably take on that endeavor if you're going to compete. Yeah. Yeah. You just can't. You can't. I mean, I used to, when I was first starting to compete, it's like, okay, I don't really have anything of my own. This customer wants a pedestal mount or something. We'll right. compete with it. Mm -hmm. Now... I mean, I know what it takes to win and it's not mm -hmm. going to be a two day mount, yeah, right, to, right. you know, I mean, it's, it's got to have some time in it. Um, and I can only, you know, do that maybe once a year, one project, I'd rather do one really good, my best I can do. And then, you know, I've done it too, where I've gone in and it's like, you know, you get an 88 or something, you know, you, mm -hmm. it's the best you can do. And you thought it was great. And the judge Just found didn't. something went wrong with it and you know, it's like ah, heartbroken because yeah. there's different levels of competition too. Yeah. I mean, we have state, national, world. There's got to be though, like I know, the other thing too is when you get into something like that, the motivation um, that you get from the positive feedback really is like, you can't put a price on that. Yeah. When you look at a piece of art that you're responsible for creating, you know, something that inspires or or just, you know, people value that right there has a, some value that you can't buy. You had to earn it with yeah. what you made. And there's something about that. I think for especially people that are, that are artistically minded, you know, that, that are really creative types, those creative types, it's almost like you do it for free. Yeah. Just because of the creative process and the reward that comes from it being done. Well, then there's, then that's why creative people uh, are often poor. <laughs> well, that's what I say. Most taxidermists are. <laughs> so, and yeah, these ones are some of my own fun projects or whatever, you know, but, uh, but we've done them for customers too, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. So you've been on this journey for quite a long time. Um, you know, I, I want to get more into, uh, how we care for stuff in the field. Okay how we get it from the field to home yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I want to sit down again and do another show about that. Before we do though, I want to finish up this uh, quiz, Brad. Mm -hmm. What what else was on the on the on the uh, quiz there, We there? only had a couple left, so We're almost done, but We're almost done. it says why is rogue taxidermy also called carcass art? It says all animals are used in the creation of a new, of a new species. Same animals are used in the creation of a new species. All animals are used in, in the creation of existing species. It's all animals are used in the creation of a new species. I, Carcass I, art. That's, that's, that's just I, like Frankenstein well, stuff. Well, I've never done rogue yep. taxidermy, but I did – one time I did do like a – there was a film and stuff, and some of it is kind of cool. And yeah. there are some guys that are Crushing really that. talented, and there's <laughs> yeah. some cool stuff that I've – I've seen, but yeah. I've just never take a lion and mix it with an yeah. eagle. Yeah. And yeah. You always see like talons the mule deer rump with the tail with a coyote. Yeah. Throwing it in yeah. and eyeballs stuck in there, whatever. Yeah. yeah. 
Have you mounted a jackalope? No. Oh, so you can't even say you have at all. <laughs> Go buy one on eBay for 50 bucks. <laughs> I know. Uh, it says, which of the following famed British explorers was an early, was also an early taxidermist? I know this one. James Simpson, James Cook, Ernest Henry. I- I'm saying Ernest Henry. Cook. It is Cook. No. James Cook. And I think that's it. Yeah. The, um, it's been kind of interesting. You look at uh, taxidermy, the evolution of taxidermy over all of the years. And every year it changes dramatically. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems so yeah. uh, with technology. And we kind of got into that a little bit earlier over there, like velvet, you know, in the past I've heard guys hauling in like um, syringes of, yeah. of uh, formaldehyde, formaldehyde yeah, yeah. that they're injecting and, and um, other things like that, which are, you're talking some serious chemical yeah. stuff. <laughs> we and we still use formaldehyde, but yeah, it's nasty stuff. You don't yep. want to. So you had some other things out there that you were showing us that you were like, "Hey, we're gonna we need to get into this." Yeah. So yeah. that's a future podcast. Look for that one, folks. Thanks for tuning into this podcast. If you want to uh, get in touch with Jeremy, where can they find you? Uh, you can look at a, our website at JudkinsCustomTaxidermy.com or. I'm bad at social media, but <laughs> Instagram, Judkins Custom Taxidermy. Um, and we'll put a link to those yep. things in the description field of our YouTube video and anywhere else we're putting content. And uh, I think that's that's it for today. Yep. All right, folks. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Look up Judkins Custom Taxidermy. Stay gritty.